But as of the end of November, um, RIM had published a blog post saying that they were expecting to leave. So we'll see how that, how that goes. Um, back in East Asia, Korea um, has implemented uh, a, a thing to protect children called uh, Smart Sheriff. Uh, and and a, I mean, that's one of the implementations, but it comes out of a policy um, to, to add additional filtering. It's required on sort of mobile devices need to have this child protection thing. Uh, and there was a report this fall uh, after the implementation in the spring saying that it actually opens up a bunch of security issues and a bunch of uh, surveillance issues on the devices that it's on. So there's, there's sort of an ongoing conversation about how to do this um, and what the right level of uh, safety versus uh, the other type of safety is. Um, not to be outdone, North Korea has added a squid proxy. So, from the European uh, segment size, I would like to uh, mention a new so-called, uh, as I used to say, censorship trend, also known as, as uh, gambling censorship. Uh, apparently, uh, the governments have decided to, that they need to uh, better regulate the gambling and betting resources on the internet. And they have uh, initiated a race of uh, pushing uh, more and more regulation and policies to uh, block, filter, and uh, somehow reduce access to these resources. Unfortunately, there are many uh, mistaken blocking, uh, uh, various cases of orbit blocking. Uh, as far as uh, collateral damage cases like uh, inconsistent. Uh, DNS mail exchange uh, record or actually TLS timeouts uh, on a website that hosts on the same IP. It's quite common in the web space environment where actually we said hosting you share the same IP with the rest of the other website. Um, what uh, I would like to mention here, uh, it's a, a report from uh, an organization in Switzerland for the European Commission. It's like uh, more than 1,500 pages, uh, and it's from 2006. Uh, what is happening actually here, it's like a table uh, that uh, mentions the, uh, the countries from left to right, like from left are the stricter countries with policies and gambling and betting regulation to the right, which they have less and less uh, uh, regulation. This has changed already. So, for instance, UK on the far right uh, side, it uh, actually uh, does some extreme blocking, which I'm going to be mentioned later in, my, in our slides. Uh, what I would like actually to give uh, to point out, it's a case that we did uh, some work later uh, before this uh, summer. Uh, was uh, the case of Greece. We did some extensive uh, study on uh, quite many ISPs. Actually, we cover most of ISPs. And we, oh, sorry for that. <laughs> uh, so uh, what's uh, actually happening in Greece is that uh, the ISPs somehow, they have started uh, uh, blocking at will. So they just decided that they need to do this regulation, okay. So they were, they were forced from the Gaming Commission to do this. But as you can see in this uh, uh, table, actually in this figure, uh, covering like uh, most uh, Greek ISPs, they have, uh, have inconsistency in blocking. Uh, so the, the red represents the site that has been blocked. Actually the far right uh, column, it's like the total site on this snapshot of the blacklist that uh, should have been blocked. And uh, the green was this, the resources, the entities that hasn't been blocked yet. Uh, I can't cover uh, the whole uh, research about Greece, but I'm going to give some examples of uh, what uh, have happened after this and what was happening during this. So mostly they have done like DNS blocking, uh, uh, some uh, companies decided to just uh, don't uh, uh, administer this well, and they have issued like HTTP uh, 403 errors, and in some cases like Vodafone, <coughs> fuck them, um, they have uh, done some uh, DPI. 
Uh, so what's, uh, what the users were uh, uh, used to uh, experience actually was that uh, this uh, blocking page. This is, uh, this is quite important if you consider that Greece was considered to be, to have like quite liberal uh, uh, views on the internet, you know, like uh, you could still uh, uh, have, uh, can download some uh, torrents and you can, I mean, th th there's, there was some IP blocking or there were some defamations, but in other words, there was not such extensive filtering. So most of the uh, of the ISPs were making like it's like this one that you see right now, uh, uh, where the u their users were being landed. What is actually happening now? Uh, it's that the ISPs are redirecting them to uh, the Gaming Commission website. Uh, uh, reminder: the Gaming Commission is actually the commission that ha issuing the blacklist, forcing the blacklist, and making laws, one of them is to punish or like uh, it's uh, considered uh, a crime to even access these forbidden uh, web resources. So the users are actually experiencing such a block page right now with this, this generic uh, image from a custom new uh, data center pointing that everything is fine. Uh, what is uh, quite interesting to mention and hasn't been mentioned yet, uh, uh, and I think it makes sense to mention it at some point, and we'll show this right now, uh, is that since uh, the Greek ISPs uh, implemented this uh, filtering infrastructure, they have started actually using the same infrastructure to block different resources was of so-called uh, illegal content. As you can see, there is an uh, encoded uh, domain name. It's in Greek. Uh, so uh, for those of you that can read HTTP, it's, like, it's quite simple. Uh, the body, it's, uh, it's null. It's, there's nothing there. And uh, it's returning the HTTP status 403. No, no block page, no nothing. So, and this has been done by Vodafone. This uh, specific uh, segment has been done by Vodafone. Uh, in uh, June 2015, they have used the Blue Code web proxy uh, for uh, utilizing a DPI. Uh, moving on, uh, another interesting case, uh, United Kingdom. Uh, we could actually have two presentations for United Kingdom, but yeah, that's sad. We have only one, and we could uh, <laughs> not mention so many things that happened the last years. But uh, something quite important that happened in 2015, is the, or and was increased in, ten, in intensity in 2015, is that the government uh, has started pressuring a lot for the I promoting filters to ISPs. But in, uh, the difference with uh, UK is that uh, they, didn't, they had don't really have a gaming commission or they don't have like a commission that uh, mentions what should be blocked and you know, makes a blacklist and whatever. So it's ISP decide on what is right that needs to be blocked, filtered, and censored. So you can actually find out what happened, like, you know, like uh, dentist website have been blocked, some bars have been blocked, uh, or uh, some website that used to do like to do like, form like the, la the keyword sex have been blocked. So a lot of false positives. Uh, what is uh, quite important to mention is the blocked project from Open Rights Group. Uh, they have done some impressive work uh, monitoring all these, uh, like all ISPs or most ISPs in uh, UK. Uh, they have used the Alexa Top 100K, and these uh, uh, results like, are from their yesterday's snapshot. So they have actually uh, found out that there are around 20, from this 100K, there are around 20, 21,000 uh, uh, websites, being, uh, resources being blocked by strict filters. 
and around 11,000 uh, websites block by default filters. Let me get uh, clear what is default filter. So when you buy a new, uh, when you are becoming a subscriber and, and, or you buy a new cellular number in UK, you are coming with this default filter. So you actually need to opt out. You need to say, hey, you know, I want to watch porn. I want to have like an uncensored uh, internet connection. Uh, uh, and this is like the latest, sub the yesterday snapshots uh, on their page. You can actually click on the slides, which we're going to publish online. Uh, they are actually having per provider the percentage of sites that have been blocked and uh, some discrepancies. Um, hmm. So uh, I would like to uh, move to a different uh, segment right now. Uh, this is uh, Middle East. Um, and continue with uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, this is uh, an excerpt from an uh, UNI uh, report from an HTTP request test. I will uh, explain more later. Uh, what is happening actually here in the case of Saudi Arabia is that they have actually blocked Arab times. This happened like this, this 2015. And they have just uh, uh, brought like a, a random, uh, just a, a, a sort, this page is blocked with an indication that this uh, 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 resource has been blocked by wire filter. Uh, I did some uh, search and I found out that that's the wire filter. It seems like a web proxy DPI, whatever, which, uh, you know, uh, Supposingly, uh, on their website, uh, you should be used uh, for good ways and, you know, uh, for, uh, as they call it, for a worry-free in internet experiences. Uh, continuing with Iraq, uh, does anyone know what happened on, to, on the normally happens end of July or specifically on 27th of July in 2015? Okay, so uh, on this, during this time, uh, normally there are the uh, school, uh, the student class exams in uh, Iraq. Uh, and what, what happened actually between 2 to 5, like 7 to 10 local Iran time, is that, as you could see from this BGP data flow, uh, is that uh, Iraq decided to actually uh, stop a bit the internet, you know, for the students to have uh, worry-free exams without teaching, and then we, <laughs> we moved on with our exams. Another interesting report that we found uh, by uh, scrapping the UNI uh, report was the HTTP invalid request line, which uh, so that there were some instances of uh, squid proxy, a web proxy that has been used from, uh, as they mentioned here, from this firewall, from VAT, Alain. I don't know what they do. Uh, moving on with uh, Iran, and specifically a very uh, small uh, segment of what happened in Iran. As I mentioned, that it's a very short presentation. We need to cover a lot of uh, things. Uh, so Iran decided to actually, they, they have been blocking uh, Telegram and so many other things. But uh, what's interesting in this case is that on the October 20, uh, 20th, uh, uh, they were, uh, the users were uh, starting uh, uh, wandering social uh, uh, media sites like, hey, what's happening? Is this blocked or not? And then said, no, actually it wasn't blocked. There were some uh, dis disturbances uh, that uh, uh, technical issues that helped us to, uh, that didn't help. Uh, and we had uh, somehow this, brought this uh, site offline, this uh, uh, telegram offline. Um, uh, and now I'm giving the word to Will. Cool. So, yeah, so in the West, one of the main things that's happened is trying to understand how to deal with this rise of uh, 
dash or ISIL or whatever we're going to call it at the moment. Um, and, and there's sort of this uh, recognition in politics that, you know, suddenly there's bad stuff on the internet again, and we need to, you know, do, do something about it, unless we think it's, you know, from one side, this is sort of a thing that's sort of generally uh, in the political mindset right now of, well, you know, it's not censorship if, if Twitter, you know, solves this problem, and maybe we should talk to Bill Gates and he'll close the internet for us. Um, uh, and, and there sort of seems to actually be this response from Silicon Valley and these big companies to try and police their content more, right? And we've seen also that as the safe harbor agreement with the EU sort of fell apart over the summer, that again, all of these content providers are taking a closer look at, at management of their, their networks and their user-generated content. And so you're seeing things like Twitter is suspending the ISIS-affiliated accounts, um, and similar things on like Facebook or whatever, right? And so this is actually showing this big hole that we've got, which is many of these companies have transparency reports. We can see when the government is asking for subscriber information, and we can see when they ask for explicit content to be removed, and we can see when other companies make copyright notices. But there's really nothing here about how much is being taken down by Twitter itself. And so we don't have great insight. And so taking this full circle, we actually do have these technologies. We use them for sites like Weibo, the Chinese equivalent to Twitter, where this open source project called Freebo Weibo monitors the Chinese social network, finds popular content that then is subsequently removed and reposts it for posterity. And so this is open source. I'd recommend that someone do this for some of the Western media as well so that we can see what's happening. Um, and, and I guess it's worth also pointing out that a lot of this stuff is happening on non-totally public websites, right? As we get into Facebook and WhatsApp groups and Telegram and all of these content providers that are having to wrestle with this, a lot of this content is not public. It's within small groups. And so it's going to be very hard for us to understand what sort of management policies are happening and what's going on. So that's sort of our whirlwind tour of sort of things that we thought were worth mentioning. There's tons more. And what we want to talk about in the in sort of the second half of this is how do we know that? What are the projects and tools that we've got that help us see uh, when there are disturbances and what perspectives we can get? So we mentioned that the initial map, um, and that, that comes from this group called Freedom House, and they publish a report each year called Freedom on the Net. And what that looks like is they, they write up a, a long sort of narrative for each country, and then they have analysts code free, somewhat free, not free against that. Uh, and, and so they do this, and there's another group called Open Net Initiative that also does this. Uh, and so you get maybe a few categories, like how free is it on the political spectrum, how free is it on you know, access to circumvention tools. Um, but what you don't get is you don't get the data backing that. You don't get the list of specific sites. You don't get when things were blocked. Because all of that is potentially harmful, right? If I, if I publish all of the data that I'm using to make my analysis, whoever's managing that network can potentially go back and figure out who it was who ran those measurements and potentially say, hey, knock it off. So this is, this is something that's been sort of struggled with for a while now by the measurement community, and we're making progress. Um, and so we're going to start with sort of the, the big player in the, in the room. So yeah, how we measure interference then? Uh, uni, uh, disclosure, I'm an Uni developer, uh, also known as uh, Open Observatory of Network Interference. Um, it's, it's been around for some years. Uh, it has some uh, peer-reviewed uh, proof of concept. Uh, it has been used to uh, analyze, in general, uh, like most uh, of the things that I saw already in my presentation. Uh, it's a, a free software. Uh, you, you could uh, uh, help by adding uh, specific test models. Uh, uh, long story short, I can point you to somehow how this looks like. Uh, with. It's uh, a, a measurement uh, platform that uh, has a backend, uh, has 
parts of clients that are submitting the reports, uh, a, 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 a new signy pipeline is uh, being developed. There is an API that is going to uh, be online soon and uh, give uh, users the uh, ability to search in a visual way. And the uh, sysadmin part that is going to manage and do all this stuff, like storing the reports. Because actually what is happening with Uni is that it stores the report publicly, so allows all people, uh, researchers or uh, interesting users to search and uh, somehow start exploring uh, through the reports, through the Uni report. Uh, a much simpler approach of a, a test, of a test mentioned in the Saudi Arabia case, is the HTTP request test. Um, uh, I, I, can't, I don't have the time to go into detail onto that, but I will give you only a short idea of how this works. Actually, it just sends to HTTP get request to the resource that we like uh, to probe. One comes through our connection, which is potentially tampered or filter sensor, whatever, and the other one comes uh, from another uh, uh, connection, like from Tor. And then there is some kind of uh, diff happening and uh, uh, some other uh, types of uh, uh, customizations are being checked in order to see if our, uh, this resource has been blocked or not. Um, there are many, many more things to say, but uh, you know, please come and find me later if you need more, or uh, read uh, on the website and help if you want. Uh, another thing that happened uh, uh, and that has been working the last year was uh, um, a Raspberry Pi distribution to increase the maintenance points of Uni and provide more uh, reports from the different uh, segments of the world. Uh, and in an easy way, this is Lepidopter. Uh, and uh, uh, moving on with IC Lab, it's uh, a, f a project that has been uh, developed from uh, the University of Stony Brook. Stony Brook, yeah. I can't even pronounce the name. <laughs> So, yeah, they have uh, done a sort of a closed system of containing, uh, of making network measurements. Um, uh, another uh, nice example of collecting network measurements, but unfortunately uh, not sensitive or not uh, censorship oriented uh, network measurements collection is the RIP Atlas. Uh, RIPE Atlas has a bunch of nodes out there, but it's being funded by RIPE NCC, and as you know, RIPE NCC has some members like Turkey and some other organizations that they would not like to uh, be associated or to uh, have any reports that are uh, negative to their presence. Cool. So yeah, so in addition to these sort of distributed platforms, right? And so these, this is a few examples of places where you've got probes in networks. We can learn a lot of stuff by looking at specific domains. Um, so there's platforms like Tor that will provide data. So on metrics.tor, I can look at how many users are connecting from Bangladesh. And I can verify that report that we showed earlier, that there was something weird going on from November to December because while Facebook was blocked, we see a corresponding spike in the number of Tor users, right? So they are you know, providing this data. And likewise, there's a few other services. So like Google shows how much connections it's getting from different countries, and we can say, uh, they actually label themselves and say, we believe that there was an, a disturbance in these places at these times, right? And so depending on how that data is shown, you have different levels of ability to, you know, trust it, right? Like, I can't, I can't actually go in and look and verify that Google's telling me the truth here. Uh, I have a better ability to do that from Tor. Um, beyond this, one of the older projects sort of in this space is crowdsourcing. Uh, Herdic Web came out of Berkman Center a while ago uh, and basically asked users who visit 
it shows them a website and says, can you or can you not access this site? And they, they check yes or no. And that, you know, gives you a somewhat noisy because now you have to trust that the users are, you know, you know, is it, you know, their connection? Is it something else? Like, you don't get the same insight into why something didn't work as you would if you were running uh, test code. Um, but you can learn a lot. Um, and then focusing on specific countries, you've got things like Great Fire, um, which basically runs its own infrastructure in China specifically, and then keeps monitor, sort of keeps tabs on popular sites that are accessible or not there. Uh, switching over to mobile interference, right? We're, we're entering a world where cell phones are gaining importance, and we've sort of found ourselves you know, having a harder time to understand exactly what it means to interfere there. There's a few projects. These range from uh, sort of Netalyzer's been around for a while. It's just sort of a connection analysis or diagnostics tool. It lets you see things like, is my mobile network preventing me from opening connections on specific ports? Um, and, and is there, you know, noticeable filtering or proxies? Um, one of the projects that came out in 2015 is something called Asia Chats. Uh, and that was, again, out of Citizen Lab. They basically looked into a bunch of the popular uh, chat networks, WeChat, KakaoTalk, Line, looked for built-in censorship lists. So is there, are there words that you can't type over these things? And looked at other management policies that were going on in those specific apps. Right? We're moving from a world where what we care about is the open web and you know, a domain to what is happening within a specific closed app ecosystem. Um, sort of. The, the equivalent from Uni as we move into mobile is this library and corresponding iPhone and Android app around this project called Measurement Kit, which is trying to reproduce some of these connectivity tests looking at DNS and HTTP uh, that, we, that we have run from Uni, but now in a mobile environment. The other thing that's gaining popularity is trying to think about what we can measure externally. So as we've been sort of you know, struggling with this question about putting things in networks and what risks we're, we're sort of exposing people to. Um, there was a paper and project that came out sort of at the end of last year, beginning of this year, called Encore, uh, which brings in the idea of I can embed the favicon, the little image for Twitter or for Facebook in my page and see if it loads for my visitors. And so if all of my visitors from a specific country fail to load the Twitter favicon, maybe that means Twitter's blocked. Uh, and so we can you know, have these visitors who aren't actually cooperating, they're not running a probe or a measurement, but we can still learn things from them. Um, similar to that, we have side channel work, and I can, um, and this got used for some of the, the Tor accessibility stuff as well, which is saying, even when there's two remote servers that I don't have control of either of them, I can, using some packet spoofing and TCP fragmentation leaks, learn if they can connect to each other or not. Uh, and so now without, you know, putting, those users aren't like cooperating, they're not running some probing software, but I as a remote observer can potentially learn about connectivity or IP level blocks. We're also still coming to terms with a world where the IPv4 space is small. Um, so you've got ZMAP, which is, there, there's um, a talk on mail security stuff that uh, Zakir will give at 32C3. Um, but they've also released something called Census just recently, which is sort of looking at what's running in different places. Uh, one of the projects that I'm involved with is called Satellite, which is looking at open DNS resolvers and what sort of DNS consistency we can learn from a single external vantage point. So we find roughly 8 million open DNS resolvers that are willing to resolve domains for you. And so you ask all of them for popular domains, and you see if there's specific ISPs or specific regions where you get weird responses back. And so now without having you know, anything except for these hopefully infrastructural DNS resolvers, I can understand if there's some sort of country or ISP level policy going on. Cool. Right. So uh, we're going to shortly cover uh, Metabot governance. Uh, what happened actually lately from the HTTP working group, they, ha they are, have been working and it seems that it's going to be accepted, uh, the HTTP status code 451. 
uh, that's a status code that, has, that is going to be used uh, in case of uh, legal uh, that websites that have been filtered, blocked, or censored because of legal issues or political incidents. Uh, I hope that this will not be passed, and uh, uh, this uh, is somehow like acknowledging the problem of uh, and saying that's okay, we could uh, censor and block uh, internet. But I would rather uh, uh, protest uh, for a more free internet. Uh, what did happen uh, good in the terms of governance is the uh, forming of a group called Human Rights Protocols Consideration Research research group uh, that uh, is exposing the relation between protocols and human rights, uh, having a focus on the rights of to freedom of expression and freedom of assembly. Uh, and uh, now Will is going yeah. to... Cool. So, <laughs> and I guess the, the point of this uh, HRPC group is that they're hoping to uh, sort of append policy on further IETF standards to include a section uh, sort of expressing what's going on in terms of the implications to freedom of expression and freedom of assembly with new protocols as they come in. So this is something that we should be thinking about as we start standardizing protocols. What are the implications? Are we doing this in a way that is going to be supporting these universal human rights? The other like, major thing in the measurement community space is that Open Tech Fund, uh, a branch of the US government, under a few layers, uh, got a big injection of like $25 million to support sort of circumvention and censorship measurement stuff. Uh, and so a bunch of projects have gotten money um, over the last year, and that's continuing now. And so there's been this injection of sort of excitement and people working on it as a result. Uh, and so it'll be interesting to see how long that continues, but that's really sort of boosted a lot of stuff. Um, but again, the community is sort of struggling at the same time with trying to understand what it means that so much of this work is now funded by, by the US. OK. Um, so it's not all roses, although I think you've already come to, to notice that. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that the tools that are out there aren't doing a good job of measuring. Just to give you some examples, um, in addition to blocking, right, which is a thing that's pretty binary, I can see if I get the wrong result or no result. What happens if I just get the result really slowly? My, my automatic test is going to have a hard time coming up with those heuristics, and we really haven't written these tests that actually are doing a good job with heuristics to understand that this is just throttled and isn't actually going to be usable um, and differentiate that, that accessible but really slow from normal. We still are pretty far behind on platform self-censorship, so our ability to understand what sort of management and, and you know, removal of content platforms are doing by themselves and unilaterally. Um, like the Greece example points out, a lot of times policies are not implemented on a country level, which is sort of how we try to think about it and how those maps that we've been showing show it, but really are at ISPs or specific regions. And so we need to tear this data apart and get down to the specific, you know, how is it going to work for these home users in this place? And that's not a question that we have a good way to answer right now. And we also don't have a good handle on the social impacts. Do people notice this? Is this? What does it mean to be extreme? How often are people hitting block pages? Like, is, is there other stuff that people are choosing not to visit, even though it's not explicitly blocked, because they, they feel unsafe on the internet because of the policy? Like, these, are, these are things that we really haven't even begun to explore. On the academic side, there's been a big conversation about ethics that's continued to sort of emerge in the last year. Um, part of that is trying to understand when it's okay to make measurements, right? If I get abuse complaints telling me to knock it off, like, if it's, if it's someone who owns an organization, sure, that seems like I probably shouldn't be doing something they don't want me to do. What happens if it's a country that tells me to knock it off? Do I just not measure their country? So, so where, where are these sorts of things, where are these boundaries? Um, for our more traditional things inside of countries, what does it mean to get informed consent, right? Are the users who are running probes or who are taking measurements on these systems understanding what they're getting themselves into? Do we as researchers even know what they're getting into and are we able to tell them those risks in a way that they can give informed consent? Um, there haven't been a huge number of you know, retributions or anyone getting in trouble 
but we don't know what could happen. We don't know how technically savvy the people who would be getting them in trouble are and if they understand the nuances. We don't understand the nuances. So these conversations are happening. Um, a lot of this, uh, there, there's a bunch of ethicists. Weirdly, it's the US Department of Homeland Security that, that published something called the Menlo Report on ethical principles for communication technologies in 2012. Um, and what that document says to some extent is that if you can't get informed consent, you should be practicing sort of minimizing risk. You shouldn't be doing anything unnecessary in order to get the measurements that you need. So now what is least risk? How do we, you know, what measurements do we need? Where are these boundaries? We're still drawing these. There aren't clear lines yet on any of this stuff. Um, but we had the first workshop on ethics uh, in August at the SIGCOM conference. So this is sort of, I think, at the forefront of a lot of people's minds in this space is what is okay, what is safe? You know, are we, are we doing a good job of both collecting the measurement data that we need to, um, but also doing it in a good way? So we're gonna end by, you know, the pitch of what you can do, how you can help. You can measure, right? You can collect the data. You can work on the code. A lot of these projects are open source. We'll put these slides on the link from the talk so that you can click on all of them and find the project that you're most excited about. You can skip the whole measurement thing and work directly on circumvention. Pluggable transports are you know, gaining standardization. There's a nice website, pluggabletransports.info, that talks about uh, the spec, which is pretty easy to implement, and so you can make your own different way of connecting. And you can have the conversation in your local jurisdiction or on the internet as a whole um, to advocate for transparency, if nothing else, so that you can you know, understand what is blocked and figure out where your community is comfortable having that. So we'll be around to answer questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So I assume there'll be some questions. <clears throat> Okay, for questions, please line up. There's one, two, three, four mics here, and we'll also take some questions from the internet. Um, the first gentleman is lined up. Um, go ahead and talk. Please talk into the microphone so we got it on tape. Thanks. As you're probably aware, more and more countries which we do not usually think as uh, restrictive are now blocking something. It's not only, I, I suppose it's not only because of the tax. Uh, so I w I'd like to ask for advice on advocacy. So in my country, there's recently uh, been some blocks implemented because of lobbyists um, trying to stop your, your, your um, the other companies that you don't want to go ahead. So, and I've been trying on behalf of the civil movement to advocate to not do that. And what I get in return is, well, we, here's the thing, we need to block this. So they are, if I give them something that can minimize collateral, collateral damage, they're okay. But in my mind that indicates deep packet inspection. So is there a recommended way, if we are okay to block this small thing, but we don't want to block the whole IP, the whole domain, do we go DPI or is, this, is there some magic pill? I don't think there's any magic pills, unfortunately. Um, I mean, so there's a few things. One is whenever you get this sort of thing, you need to focus first on transparency because that's something that's much easier to get public opinion, right? There, there's always going to be a debate about where the line of what is acceptable and unacceptable content is, but I think most people are going to be pretty happy to say that we need to have public record and public knowledge of what is blocked so that we can have the conversation, that we can audit that what's being blocked is what we've decided is worth blocking. So the first thing is if there's these regulations or things that are coming without that ability for people to inspect and understand what's happening, that's something that's really important and I think much less controversial that you can push for. And that's worth having. Um, in terms of should you be blocking full IPs and the collateral damage thing, That's a hard question. It depends a lot. I mean, I think we're going to, wor we're going to enter, and we are, we are moving towards a world with more encryption through let's encrypt and some of these things. And so 
what you could imagine is if you're doing things like just taking SNI or specific domains and trying to block those, that's something that potentially technology is going to surpass in the next three, five years, something like that. We'll enter a world where that sort of block isn't going to be nearly as effective. Hopefully we'll get to a world with encrypted DNS and with you know, good encryption uh, in some of these newer HTTP-like protocols where you can't do these easy DPI fixes. So putting in boxes like that, the hope is they become obsolete faster, whereas doing IP blocks, that's something that's harder to rectify that damage. That's, that's my personal opinion. <laughs> okay, thank you. Tell me back there at mic number five, is that a question? Okay, please talk into the mic. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Um, I'm gonna ask about the funding that you mentioned. So you mentioned that the American government funds much if not all or most of your, the work that you do and a lot of the work on censorship uh, research. Uh, I'd like you to talk more about that. Um, what do you make of it? How do you think this fits, your work fits into America's foreign policy uh, objectives and if it does in any way? Sure, um, so, so I guess what I'll say is there are other sources of funding too. Um, a bunch of this stuff happens from academics who get funded through, through grants and through you know, the university grant process uh, rather than directly through, through governmental funding. Um, I think it's reasonable to see this as in line with U.S. foreign policy, right? They, they would like to have generally that freedom of expression. That's something that, you know, I think that that group at least, right, the, the Radio Free Asia Broadcasting Board of Governors is pretty in favor of. Um, and so I think for the projects where their incentives align, it, it's not like you're not agreeing to do anything, right? What it's potentially doing is it's shifting the work, right? And so what we need to be careful about is that uh, the work that we're doing isn't getting shifted purely to circumvention and away from something like surveillance, which is maybe less exciting or less, less funded. And so that's the thing where we need to be careful. But I think that you know, the specific things that they're funding are all great projects that I'm happy to see getting that injection of support. Um, and, and I think you know, the call that I would make is that we should have more people also stepping up to fund. I think that's something that you know, what I've heard from Open Tech Fund is they would also like to see that, right? This isn't something that's sustainable from a single government because it, you know, the optics don't necessarily look great and also because why should they be able to make those decisions? And so the way that we counter that is not by you know, refusing to take money, but it's by saying, hey, maybe Germany should be giving more money, maybe a bunch of these other countries that care about these same you know, freedom of expression issues should also be stepping up to help us. What's the mix right now, um, private to government funding, off the top of your head? That is like, I, I have no idea, right? There's a bunch of companies, there's a bunch of VPNs, and stuff that are making money from users, they're not gonna tell you how much money they make, but they're pretty big players in the space. Um, OTF, right, they, they do publish that their, their grant from the government's 25 million, so we've got that, but I don't know how big the overall space is. Okay, um, we have a question from the internet here. Yes, um, so this Talking is- Talking to your mic, please. This is a question from Jenix and Hamid. Um, What's bad about recognizing censorship with error code 451? And um, because the page will be blocked nonetheless, and it's good to know what happened, right? Okay, uh, so I think that by having an, uh, a status code of recognized censorship, it's like we acknowledge, as I mentioned in the presentation, we acknowledge the fact that, okay, yeah, censorship is for granted, and we should assign a status code. I, I guess, to my opinion, instead of just assigning new status code of something that we can't, uh, really happen, like, like internet should, should not be censored. So uh, assigning a status code to the HTTP should not happen. So if, if they would like to do it, they will, like, they will do it in a different way, but assigning, like changing the, the status code and assigning and uh, uh, acknowledging the fact that we should have more, uh, you know, like a, a, a blocking code, no, I, I, I don't think that is a way to go. Um, 
I don't have any alternatives on that, but uh, you know, I mean, wh why, why we need to, to have alternatives on blocking the internet? They, they, they do it otherwise without status code, so why to give the freedom of using also status code? Said, oh, okay, so this website, they will return the status code, so now we know that, okay, you know, these sites are blocked, yeah. They will still, blo still block, uh, as I mentioned, the presentation style, uh, sites and resources, legally and illegally. So now they will have also the 451 status of the legal, uh, the, so this is the legal-like status code, and you know, this will continue, they will continue uh, blocking again, you know, websites illegally. Okay, thank you. Number two, your go. Uh, th uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, I have a question about Talking the, to your mic, please. I have a question about the uh, gambling, uh, about the gambling uh, censorship. Uh, because this seems like the beginning of a uh, general kind of censorship. Uh, do you have any idea if anywhere in Europe uh, it was possible to get this removed in some way by uh, any legal me uh, measures, uh, lawful measures, something like that? Well, actually, most of, of these blockings are quite trivial. They, are, uh, uh, they, are, they were doing the uh, DNS blocking, so you could just change your name server, your resolver, and you could route around this issue. Uh, many of these sites can be uh, seen from other, uh, like they can be seen by t via Tor, or they they are just trying to block this locally. They were they were just trying to do this in a local way. They are not they are not doing it well right now. They are just uh, would like to uh, let's say stop viewing this content from the uh, non-power users, let's say. So, uh, so I'm, I come from Bulgaria and there they uh, switched from uh, just DNS blocking to IP blocking. And they've been doing that pretty thoroughly for the sites they were ordered to block, which uh, results in a lot of collateral damage for this. And uh, we know that, yeah, using Tor, using any kind of VPN, just go around that, it's extremely trivial. But it uh, creates a lot of problems and it creates a very bad precedent for everything else because right now it's gambling sites, then we have the infrastructure and then it's anything else. So uh, are you aware of anyone that is working to stop this on a political level? We should, we should speak to these people. We should do stuff like mentioning that, hey, you are destroying the internet, you know? You can't just uh, start blocking an IP, you know, that there are like thousands of websites there uh, hosted. Right, so again, this is, this is the place for advocacy, right? Finding your local groups that are caring about internet freedom, um, working with them to find, especially instances of collateral damage are a great place for advocacy of look at these sites that for whatever reason are being blocked. This isn't a cool thing to be doing. We really are overstepping, we're losing transparency. These are all great arguments that you can you know, take to your politicians and lawmakers and, and find the ones who are gonna help champion the issues for you. We tried that, uh, didn't work. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, number six, your go. Hi, uh, thank you very much for an interesting overview. I wondered if you would like to share some thoughts on maybe combining or proposals to combine censorship measurement with censorship circumvention. Uh, there have been some proposals recently to, for tools that combine the two, and I just wondered what your thoughts were on that. Yeah, so there was, there was, a, there was a paper that came out um, about the, the circumvention tools are a way to understand measurement. Um, again, you've got exactly the same issues about uh, what are the risks that users are facing, right? And, and that's now maybe you're having a harder argument about um, not knowing what's going on, that you know that this is a user who is actively you know, worried about something and trying to get around something. And so are you now comfortable trying those sites that are blocked, which are the ones that are being looked for? And what sort of dangers are you getting your user into? Um, at the same time, there are plenty of tools that are already doing this, right? You've got a set of tools that do fallback stuff. So they first try to make the request locally, and then if it doesn't work, they run it through a proxy. So they're already exposing the user to that risk. You might as well collect that data, right? Um, and so then it's just a measure of what sort of anonymity and protection against that collected data do you get so that if that data gets public because expect data to leak to the people you don't want it to, how does it not get anyone in trouble, right? Because it's easier to just take that whole database of 
all of the users in the country who tried to visit these bad sites than having to do the network, like measurements of them individually. And unfortunately, they do collect data of these users, and they don't know what to do with this data, some uh, sense of circumvention tools. Thank you. OK. Um, another question from the internet. And please, talk into your mic. All right, this is a question from JNIX. Um, it's a two-parter. So um, there are a lot of methods for filter evasion, SSH tunnels, ICMP, DNS tunnels. That being said, is, there, uh, is any government able to effectively censor or block experienced users who are able to use these, um, I guess, uh, tunnels? Uh, and uh, is it too paranoid? to believe that uh, they might intentionally allow, the government might intentionally allow some protocols that they can decode um, because you know, they, they want to actually inspect what people are doing. Uh, it is not too paranoid to expect that. There are instances that you know, have shown up of proxies or other things that are being run by governments to be able to get a sense of what users are doing. Um, if you are looking for your technically competent adversary, you're probably looking to China. Um, we've seen different things from that network. Uh, and because of how big it is and the diversity of ISPs, you see different things and you get mixed reports. But there's a sense that at least some of the time you get um, weirdly uh, like long-term connections that don't look like TLS will get throttled or become you know, flaky. And that affects a lot of these tunneling solutions. We still need more work on being able to get reliable things. Maybe you use ISP or IP diversity. Maybe you use lots of short-lived connections, UDP. There's a bunch of different things out there to try. There aren't good things that seem that you know, everyone feels are reliable and are hard to, for, an, uh, for a technically competent adversary to block. OK, there's somebody waiting on number five. Go ahead, talk into uh, the mic. Uh, yes. Uh, about. I think it was around six months ago, there was a website that was forced to shut down that archived political tweets from politicians. Uh, essentially, the politicians strong-armed them into shutting down. My question is, what kind of implementation or capabilities would you suggest to try to prevent that kind of strong-arming from happening again with archiving suppressed tweets and things like that? So depending on what threats you are worried about, we've got a number of technologies that our community knows about. We've got hidden services. If you want to run something where it's IP address and the server is not known, um, so if you feel like the infrastructure you know, is in danger, um, there are ways to make that site run in a way that it is anonymous. Um, you can look at the different legal jurisdictions and come with a jurisdiction where you are you know, not going to have the same ability Right? If it's in a different country, it becomes much harder. Um, and then you can find a set of lawyers if you believe this is legal, which, I mean, in a lot of places it is. Um, you just need to find the right representation where you don't give in and show that this actually is an instance of free speech. Right? Um, if I remember correctly, they actually strong-armed Twitter into revoking the developer access of the website in question. OK, so, so, so then it's things like Free Weibo that are crawling and site scraping. Right? Okay. We, we, you can't expect that the platform is necessarily going to be happy about that. You can potentially raise a stink and get the platforms to reverse those sorts of policies. Um, or you can try and show the value of the system so that they realize that this is something that is worth having, right? In the same way that we have um, things like chilling effects, archiving the DMCA takedown requests, it may be worth having you know, this sort of transparency and trying to convince the platforms. Um, but at the same time, you can again make the argument that even without the platform support, there's, there's value in doing this sort of thing. All right, thank you. Thank you. We have a tight schedule, so this will be the last question we're taking from number four. Is there anybody else? You'll have to come up front for later. Number four, go ahead. Um, just a short question. Um, you mentioned apps very shortly. Um, there is like this uh, debate, especially around Apple, that they have like um, a very special way of thinking about like what is a good app and what not. And did, is there anybody out there who measures like taken uh, like apps that are not approved or something like that? Is there a, something exists, or don't you consider this as censorship because it's from a company and not from a state? That absolutely seems valuable. I don't know of any projects that are doing a good job, like that are, that are out there yet doing that. 
So I'd love to hear about one. Um, and I, again, there's been reports of you know the Google Play Store entering China. That's going to involve some sort of management of what apps are allowed. Uh, and again, like keeping track of that stuff is super yeah, maybe valuable. maybe someone could do that because I think it's quite important today. I agree. <laughs> if, if you want to do this, please come and find us. <laughs> Okay, we'll close this talk now because we're tired on schedule. Thank you very much. Let's have a last hand. Thanks. Thank you.